This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. The world is witnessing a tragedy in northern Japan. An earthquake followed by a tsunami and then a near nuclear catastrophe. That's caused trembles in the Japanese economy as those nuclear plants are no longer providing electricity, which has resulted in rolling blackouts throughout northern Japan. And as a result, car production lines that used to produce car parts are exported to Australia and the rest of the world are no longer making those parts. So to look at this and to look at the economic fallout, I'm joined by Associate Professor Hodaka Marita from the Australian School of Business. Hodaka, thank you very much for joining You're us today. You're welcome, my pleasure. So, I understand you teach the economics of Japanese business and government. You, you must have been looking at how the ga Japanese government planned for devastation like this. Did they prepare well enough? Well, people are working very hard to improve the situation, to, to cope with the disaster. But my feeling is that the decision-making at the top level in companies, in this case, you know, in companies as well as government, does not necessarily seem to be very timely and appropriate. So it seems like under the not necessarily optimal top level decision, people at the middle of the organization, at the bottom of the, of the organization, are working very, very hard to try to, to cope with, with, with a disaster. It seems to me that that is what's going on in Japan. And it seems to me that that is a kind of particular sort of feature of Japanese organization, public and private in general. So how do Japanese organizations differ in terms of their management structure and how they delegate authority through the levels? So uh, people argue right, that comparing Japanese type organization versus non-Japanese type, say American or Australian, whatever, Western type of organization, real decision making right is more delegated at the bottom. So it is not really top-down type management. It is more like bottom-up type management. And I more or less agree with that sort of view. So, I mean, Every organization has strengths and weakness, right? So I think that strength of Japanese organization is capability at the relatively lower level of, of organization. I think that is the strength of the Japanese type organization. But decision making uh, at the top doesn't seem to, it kind of seems to be a little bit shaky rather than very determined, okay, so here is a policy, put priority. Right? Do this first and then do this and this. Right? Kind of very clear uh, decision and instruction, which of course is very difficult at this kind of time. Should be made by the government as well as relevant companies, but which doesn't seem to be done very in, in optimal manner. Okay, so, so is there actually a difference between crisis management in Japanese and uh, other Western countries? After all, I'm thinking of parallels here with Christchurch, of course, much smaller earthquake, but uh -huh. at the same point, you had the heads of the companies who were immediately on site and almost directly yeah. operations on the ground. Uh -huh. Would you see that in a Japanese company? Uh, probably to uh, to less extent, I believe. For example, you know, when uh, we look at the TV, the president of or a Tokyo Electricity Company doesn't show up very frequently. But this must be the matter of CEO taking very strong leadership and initiative. So is this a difference then in culture? Why are leaders of Japanese co uh, companies acting in a slightly different way? That, that is a good question, right? So, so first of all, uh, too much generalization might be gen dangerous. So of course, I mean, many Japanese companies have excellent top, top management, right? So this is just very rough sort of generalization, but overall, the quality of top management is not as high as the quality of top management in some other countries. And question is why, right? So I think that is a million dollar question and actually what I'm trying to address that question. Right? One answer I'm kind of trying to 
propose some of my papers, right, is that so-called Japanese system is a system for catching up economy. So Japan was in the process of catching up in 1950s, 60s, 70s, right? So so-called Japanese system worked very well at that time. So rather than inventing completely new product, completely new process, what is more important is take existing technology, import, for example, machinery from Germany or US or whatever, and improve the operation of the imported technology, optimize the way of making use of the technology. And that is more like done at the shop floor level. But the quality of top management was not very important. So the top management position, in my view, in, in those days, were, it was more like a world for people who worked very, very hard. So, so people work at the lower level. Some of them who did extremely well are promoted to top management as, as a reward. So they are not really trained in terms of making a top management decision making. But it is fine because, it was fine because the decision making at the top management level was not very important when the economy was catching up. But now Japan has caught up. So what is becoming more important is that sort of, you know, the, the managerial decision making. But is this because there, there isn't the management training? The management schools aren't there to actually generate the, the, uh, the right quality of management? Or is it a question of, well, people are always, always expected to get promoted, so you will end up with the person who's on the factory production line, ends up in senior management if they work hard enough? Because it was not very important, and therefore there was less opportunity for such skill to be trained inside the company as well as outside. Um, for example, you know, up to 1970s, 80s, there was very few business school in Japan. But nowadays, the number of business schools offering MBA degree in Japan is increasing rapidly. So that maybe that could be a sign managerial skills are now becoming increasingly important in Japan. So we're really seeing an increase then in, uh, in seeing the desirability of employees who are multi-skilled, who can do a number of different tasks, including uh, being a good manager. There's a famous example of sausage factory, right? So imagine sausage factory, mm -hmm. and imagine that I am working for packaging the, at the very end. So I am encouraged to reduce the, the, the failure rate of packaging to zero, right? And then I eventually realized that in order to reduce defection rate to zero, right, what should be done is change how sausage is heated, right? And I came up with that idea because I was working for heating process before I'm assigned to package process, right? Without that, I never came up with that idea, right? So workers with multiple skill are more likely to come up with good idea concerning how to improve the process. Okay, so, so you can build up those, those skills if you, of course, work for the company throughout most of your life. And that is sort of a, a well-known tradition in the past for Japanese com uh -huh. companies of having the job for life. Mm -hmm. Has that changed since the uh, economy in Japan hasn't been doing that well over the past decade? Right, so um, it is changing, but slowly. You know, I mean, it is not easy to measure that. So proxy for that, is job retention rates, meaning on average how many years employees work for the same company. And job retention rate was not drastically declining, but gradually decreasing recently. So uh, th there must be different ways that they recruit uh, their employees, particularly internally and externally. C uh, can you explain how, how Japanese companies go, go through that recruitment process? Um, so first of all, the entry level, Right, the way, well, in, in mid-1980s or at that kind of time, right, so you might think that companies are very eager to find out if these people have good skill in cost accounting and financial accounting, marketing, and th that kind of thing. Not really. What they are looking for is more like personality, right, or club activities, right? So, uh, in other words, they are, they are trying to see the personality fit between 
job candidate and the company's culture. But, but that seems really curious. Why do you have these big, well-renowned multinational companies that are actually interested in what people do in their free time and what fun they have and the personality of the person rather than whether they've got the academic qualification? I mean, of course, some minimum level of academic qualification is important. Uh, but those companies are confident in their ability to train their employees after they're being employed. And that is also based on the idea that most of them work for the company for a very long time. So actually, you know, I, before starting my academic career, I, I started working for a company. And I was told among not only me, but all of my cohort were told, well, in the first 10 years, we do not really expect you to be very profitable, profitable for the first 10 years. So 22 years old people, right? So and up to 32 years, that's a training period. And after that, I mean, in, in other countries, after 10 years, almost everybody might be gone, right? So have there been any studies in, about the long-term view of companies in Japan and how long they look ahead? How long they look ahead? This long-term view is often many people talk about it, but there's some controversy. Do they really have a long, longer-term view or not? That, I think, is still unresolved question. What is sort of clear is job retention rate is about double compared to the U.S. So that is true, right? But longer term view is more like vague concept. And there is no sort of very hard evidence about that. But there must be some grounds for optimism then, although particularly northern Japan is just a sea of tragedy and devastation. If companies are taking a long term view, then surely there must be optimism for the Japanese economy that it will recover from this. Yes, uh, I, I believe that that will, at least in the long run, the strength and the capability of at the shop floor level will uh, be a very important force to, to recover the Japanese economy. Professor Hodaka Marita, thank, thank you very much. much. Thanks very much. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.